My name is Alan Duncan. I know most people in the room. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about FEAST, the Feed Assessment Tool. And I'm going to talk about the why, the what, the when, the where of FEAST. So firstly, why? Why do we need a better approach to livestock feed intervention? Well, we all know that uh, feed is a key issue in developing world livestock systems. Uh, and we see this from the many feast reports that come, come through our hands. Um, this is an, just one example of uh, the extreme seasonality of feed supply. This is in Wanaga in Ethiopia. Also, the solutions identified, I did a tag cloud of, of again from the Africa Rising reports of some of the, the things that farmers mentioned around solutions. Uh, and you can see some of it's around feed, some of it's around breeding, around credit, water, a whole range of things. Um, then when, uh, so some uh, thoughts on the evolution of feast. Um, the tool was originally developed at a, a workshop we held in Hyderabad as, far, as part of the IFAD-funded fodder adoption project uh, back in 2009. Feast started out as this kind of spreadsheet on my computer, um, fairly ugly, kind of almost worked, but not quite. Um, we took that and gave it to a developer who uh, developed this much uh, fancier kind of macro-driven Excel spreadsheet, uh, which worked pretty well. I think many of you will be familiar with that. However, late last year we discovered that the use, use of that spreadsheet was subject to the vagaries of Microsoft um, updates, and we realized that a lot of the VBA code, which was at the heart of that, was no longer really supported by Microsoft, so it was quickly becoming obsolete. So we decided to, to develop a standalone application. Um, Emil Heidekamp of Sonata Learning, uh, he worked originally around developing the learning materials, but when he saw the, the, the spreadsheet, he felt he could do something better. And so we've been working with him over the last couple of months to develop this new data application, which uh, we're, we're going to give you a copy of today as you leave the room. And then in, in terms of global uh, reach of the tool, we've, uh, you can see most of it is Ethiopia and East Africa, but it's beginning to be applied in, in South Asia and also in West Africa, and many other countries that, that we haven't got reports for. So if you have reports, or if you know of reports, then please send them to us and we'll, we'll publish them on our repository. Coming to, to So What, we've developed this tool. So what? Um, how, does it, how does it help? With, uh, with designing better feed interventions that are likely to be more used by farmers. Well, as we've used it, um, the, the original idea was to help give us ideas for interventions. It's not a, it's not a recipe book. It doesn't give uh, cut and dry answers, but it does help us in the thought process in producing uh, better feed interventions. Those that are appropriate, those that are owned by farmers, and those that fit the local context. Um, but another kind of byproduct of the application of FEAST that we've noted over the years is that those who apply the approach um, benefit from a broader knowledge of, of farmer constraints, a broader knowledge of the feed context. They are better able to think through what would work well where. And so we see changes in, in the perspective of those that use the tool as well. Where next? Um, we have a sister tool which we call TechFit, which is much more about a systematic prioritization of specific interventions. We've got a list of around 35 feed interventions. Um, and this tool helps to assess the local context and suggest those which are likely to work uh, most effectively in, in a given context. We've also been looking for opportunities to apply similar approaches to other areas, for example, around uh, livestock health interventions, livestock breeding interventions, um, and indeed in other areas other than livestock. Um, we've been developing this suite of uh, learning materials, which you'll hear about after coffee, and um, we're going to roll those out, uh, make those available for use in the very near future. Um, the final thing we're hoping ultimately is to develop some kind of global uh, database which will harvest data from FEAST and make it uh, generally available to researchers and others.
Um, thank you everyone. So, as Peter said, my name is Ido, uh, Ido Dro. I'm Hillary's Head of Capacity Development based in Nairobi. And uh, as was mentioned, I've been uh, fortunate to work with Helen, Ben, and many others in the FEAST team over the past year or so to really apply some instructional design and a blended learning approach. And basically, uh, a learning approach to how we can apply the FEAST tool. And that's what I'd like to spend the next 15 minutes um, talking a bit more about. I'll go relatively quickly. Um, so there'll be a lot of slides that I go relatively quickly over. But please feel free later to ask any specific questions. And of course, all of the materials will be, this presentation, as well as many other materials, will be available um, online for you. So, um, as it's possible that some might see this presentation other than those who are in the room right now, I have an introductory slide that actually references back to Alan's presentation, but I don't think this room needs any introduction about the context of FEAST and the evolution of the FEAST tool. If you are watching this online, there will be a hyperlink, and please go and see that one first. So what is instructional design? Well, basically, organizations have a mission, we are aiming to do stuff, and instructional design helps us apply these principles systematically to help learners gain and retain new knowledge. Are they then instructors? Well, not necessarily. They work with instructors and e-learning developers and others to put together a comprehensive and engaging learning experience. So basically, in many ways, think of it as a bridge um, there was talk about the research community and the development community and bringing them together. Instructional design is one of those disciplines that helps do that. Because it takes research outputs and helps move them along the development and uptake um, pathway. So what was our role? So last year um, we had some discussions and we were invited to come in and see how we can help make the feast even better. And we started by uh, having a lot of talks with, with Alan, with Ben, with other feeds experts to, to basically understand it and also to observe the way FEAST was delivered in the previous version. So what is, what is our baseline? How are people reacting with it? How does it work? Our goal was then to improve the classroom experience but also to extend it beyond. One of the, one of the issues that we have faced and are facing was that in order to conduct FEAST properly, there needed to be a FEAST expert in the room. And that often tended to be an ILRI or a CGIR person. And that was not very sustainable in terms of demands and in terms of taking it to scale. So we're looking to enhance research skills. We're looking also to enhance computer and data analysis skills to be able to use the tool properly. But also, as we went along, report writing skills so that participants can then sell this idea in their own organizations and get the buy-in and get all the support that they need in order to take it forward. So the course touches on all these three areas. Now, instructional design enabled us to do a lot. It enabled us to adapt it to an online delivery. It, en it enabled us to redesign and tweak reference guide and job tools and so on. So quite a lot that it enabled us to do. Um, well, obviously we began, as I mentioned, by analyzing what was there and then redesigned the classroom materials using adult learning theories. Um, thinking about specifically the target audience and what kind of learning systems and approaches are likely to work best for them. So, when most time when people say e-learning, they think of, oh, it's a little multimedia presentation that I take on the internet, I watch video, I answer some questions, and there is a bit of that in what we produce. But uh, really, the better thinking is that, you know, there's, there's three contexts. Um, you know, there's the classroom that we're all familiar with, there's point of use, which would be providing instructions on the actual interview questionnaire, so that, oh, I have information when I need it. And then there's online. And so self-guided, collaborative, and instructor-led. 
you know, our three different modes of instruction. So um, obviously, traditionally, we've been operating in this space, traditional classroom instruction for BEAST. But of course, now we're enhancing it, so we're adding some self-guided, self-guided, uh, some self-guided materials. Now, the only issue, though, is online learning is great if you're online. And so a large percentage of our audience you know, is, is not, does not have the sort of internet connectivity to access you know, even YouTube or the absolute bottom necessary for media-rich experience. And so that's an example. So on a scale, on a scale of Pakistan and Singapore, most of the regions that we operate with are down here. And this is well below the uh, threshold of what we need to do when you take these courses online. So, and as you know, mentioned, that's when we said, okay, can we put this in people's hands without need for the internet? So we looked at a lot of technologies, and unfortunately, as you said, a lot of the, a lot of the research and interest in developing offline solutions died out around 2005. So most of the solutions we found out of date, or they're being maintained by the military were very expensive. So we eventually, though, we looked at what was around, and we came up with our own um, solution, which basically took the, the core of our LMS and put it onto a USB drive, which would then be distributed you know, just through conventional means. 